Okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's start our uh, lecture. So, this course is called Stochastic Models and Their Applications, right? Of course, when we talk about stochastic models, so indeed, we need to study probability first. So then, the very first question is, uh, what is probability? So why we need to learn probability? So we learn probability because uh, um, we need to handle uncertainties. So we know that many events cannot be predicted with uh, total certainty, So which means that we don't know everything for sure, right? So, for example, if you ask me the question, will it rain tomorrow? Well, of course, I cannot answer for sure. So, I've stayed in Singapore for quite, for, uh, for quite a few years. So, I know that Singapore rains. So, he, here, it rains very often, right? However, it's, uh, it's August. August is not the rain season uh, for Singapore. So by my experience, I may say to you that probably um, if you just let me estimate, I would say the chance of rain tomorrow would be 50%, just like a flip a coin, right? You flip a coin, you know that with 50% of chance, you will see has, and with 50% of chance, you will see the other side, which is called tails. But then, I think probably you can accept my explanation. So 50% of chance it will rain tomorrow. But if you think of that a bit more, so you may ask me the question, what does it mean? What does it mean that with 50% of chance it will rain tomorrow? What's the meaning of that? So if we think of tomorrow, say, it will either rain or not rain, right? By the day after tomorrow, I will know that for sure. So what does this 50% uh, of chance mean? So how to explain this? I think uh, because uh, if, if you just let me explain weather, I know that there are a lot of factors that may affect tomorrow's weather. I cannot explain that to you clearly. But as I said, whether it will rain or not, just like flipping a coin. So maybe I can explain the basic idea of uh, probability by flipping a coin, right? So I have uh, a coin in my hand. So as I said, it has two sides, right? So the side with, uh, with a hat is called has. And the other side is called tails, right? So has tails, so which is a coin. Then, so we know that if we flip this coin, there are two possible outcomes. So it could be, so this has will land up, or the tails land up. So only two possible outcomes. So of course, if I flip it, before the flipping, I don't know whether I will see has or tails. So, which is uncertainty, right? Then, how can I describe or how can I quantify so such a likelihood or such uncertainty? How can I study this, right? Then, one very intuitive idea is that even if for one flip, I don't know the result. But if I can flip many, many times, then intuitively, I would say that, so we should have has in around one half of the flips. So why is so? Because uh, if we observe this uh, coin, so we study this carefully, so you can see that it's, uh, the shape of that is round. So, or it's uh, in an almost perfect symmetry. The shape of that is symmetric. And also, it's uh, made of uh, certain metal, right? 
So the mass of that is distributed evenly everywhere. So in terms of the distribution of the map, it's also perfect. Because of this, because of the properties of this coin, if we flip it many, many times, then you would expect that the proportion of heads should not be much bigger than the proportion of tails. Right? Why is so? Just like what I said, because the shape of that is symmetric, the mass is distributed evenly. So that's because of the property of this uh, of this coin. So in this way, I think it's a it's a very intuitive, but I would say it's a very convincing explanation. So in this way, uh, we can say the probability of coin lending heads is not high. So again, what does it mean? Just like what I said, it means that if, if we flip it many, many times, then we would expect the proportion of heads should be around one half, right? So that's a, the very first step for establishing the idea of probability. So you see the probability means the proportion of heads, right? So then let's think of a, a question like this. So suppose we flip a coin 100 times. Should we get has exactly 50 times? So it could be, right? If you're lucky enough, you may see exactly 50 has. It could happen. But you know that, so if you really flip 100 times, it is not very likely that you will have exactly 50 has. Right? So if, you, if we think of this a bit more, some of you may feel confusing. So what I said just now is that if we flip it many, many times, then the probability should be one half. But if we flip exactly 100 times, then the chance that we have exactly 50 times of has may not be very likely. Right? So then, in this way, how do you understand this probability? To understand this probability, maybe we need to introduce something called relative frequency first. So in this example, so if we think of uh, flipping a coin 100 times, then the number of has over the number of flips, which is 100, it's called relative frequency of heads. So for example, if you're lucky enough, you just got 50, 50 heads, then this relative frequency is exactly equal to one half. If you see 46 heads, then it's equal to 0.46, right? Then you see, by this definition, actually this relative frequency is not exactly the same as probability. As I explained just now, so this probability is a number that depending on the property of this coin, right? Because this coin is symmetric, because the mass is even, then so that probability of has must be equal to one half. But if you flip it many, many hundred times, so that number, the relative frequency, may not be exactly equal to one half, because uh, it depends on a lot, right? So you see there's uh, some difference between relative frequency of uh, and the probability. But how to connect them? So actually, the probability should be understood as the long-run relative frequency. So what does this long-run relative frequency mean? It means that so you need to flip it many, many times. 100 times may not be enough. We need to flip a, a lot more. 500 times, 10,000 times, and so on. As the number of flips goes to infinity, so 
So this relative frequency should converge to a number. So that number is called longer relative frequency. So in this way, you can see that this probability, if it is understood as this longer relative frequency, actually it should be understood as the limit of this relative frequency. The relative frequency. You need to flip it many, many times. As the times of flips go to infinity, then so your relative frequency will converge to a number. And that number should be understood as a probability. So that's the explanation. So through this, you can see that when we talk about relative frequency, it depends on a lot. So this relative frequency may not be a fixed number. So today, you flip 100 times. Maybe this relative frequency is 0.52. You see 52 times of hex. Tomorrow, you flip another 100 times. Maybe, so the relative frequency could be 0.56, right? So that number, this relative frequency, is, is random. But it should have a, a limit which is fixed, which is deterministic. So that limit should be understood as a probability. Right? So that's the way to understand what is a probability. Probability should be deterministic. It's deterministic because this coin is fixed. It depends on the property of this coin. So if this coin is fixed, then probability is fixed. Right? So, so let's uh, uh, so let's uh, maybe let's uh, explain this uh, as a as a figure. So here, uh, actually, I ran uh, the simulation of this uh, uh, ligand coin. So this is very simple gate. So this one. Uh, <coughs> so I wrote a uh, my lab. A very simple MATLAB program, and uh, so to mimic this uh, a flipping coin gate, and I record the relative frequency uh, after each flip, up to 1,000 flips. So here, maybe let's uh, let's check this uh, so this curve. So here, uh, so this left panel is the relative frequency for up to 50 flips. So you see the first point is here. It is the first flip. So can I see, can I tell whether it's a tails or has? So this is a relative frequency of has, right? The first flip is, uh, after the first flip, the relative frequency is zero, which means that so the first flip should be should be tails, right? Then you see that the after the second flip, the relative frequency increases to one half. So which means that the second flip should be half, right? So then the first the third flip, you see it's a uh, it drops. The curve drops. Drops means uh, it must be tails. So you see. The first one tails, has, tails, 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 until the, the ninth flip, which is the, the second, the second has, right? So then, so for example, if uh, by the tenth flip, if we wish to calculate this relative frequency, so we know that we have uh, two has because the curve jumps two times, right? Two has over ten flips, so by ten flips, the relative frequency of has is just 0.2, right? You see that this curve will go up and down, up and down, right? So in a pretty 
random way. So until the 50th uh, left. And this uh, a red panel. So it's actually it's uh, so it's the record frequency up to 1,000 flips. You can see that at the beginning, so the curve uh, fluctuates heavily. It can change in a more severe way. But after after you have uh, many flips, so it becomes pretty stable, right? And it will go up and down around one half. But at the 1,000th flip, it's close to one half, but still not exactly one, uh, one half, right? So this is the um, record frequency of has uh, after 1,000 flips. So it's, a, it's random because it's a record frequency. But the limit should be there. The limit is the probability. So this is a very intuitive uh, introduction of uh, probability. So maybe we can, uh, so let me just summarize something. So we have, uh, uh, we have learned through this uh, uh, introduction. So to think of probability, so the, the important thing you need to keep in mind is that when we talk about probability, we need to think of something called random experiment. So what is a random experiment? So the definition is pretty simple. An experiment whose outcome cannot be known in advance is called a random experiment. So which is just a flip a coin, right? So you flip a coin, you don't know whether you see heads or tails. So it's a random experiment. And of course, you can, you can also flip the other thing, say a die, right? A die is just a, you know, it's a, a little cube which has uh, six facets. And on each, on each facet, there are the dots. So it has six outcomes. One, two, three, up to six. That's a die, right? So, and uh, so this is a random experiment. Random experiment, so we don't know the outcome. And we need to study the outcome. We need to study the likelihood, uncertainty, whatever. And then how to study that? So we need to think of a number. So that number is between 0 and 1, so which is called probability. So, so this probability is assigned to every site of possible outcomes. So here, you may feel a bit confused because uh, we just talked about the probability of heads or tails, right? Heads and tails are two outcomes. But here, we talk about the so probability of a set of outcomes. What does it mean? Because uh, when we study probability, so we need to have some, we, if we wish to have some flexibility, it's more convenient for us to study the probability not just for one outcome. Sometimes we may be interested in so the probability that the outcome is in a set, not just one, right? For example, you flip a die, maybe as long as the outcome is a one, two, three, you will win. If it's a four, five, six, you will lose. Then whether it's one or two or three will be the same for you, right? So in this way, you will be interested in the probability that your outcome is in one, two, three. So in this way, it's more convenient for us to think of probability of a set of outcomes. So from now on, we only define probability for a set of outcomes, not just for individual outcome. But it is possible that your set has only one outcome, right? So this is our uh, convention. When we talk about probability, so by default, the probability is assigned to a set of outcomes. But it is possible that the set has only one outcome, right? So that we can have some flexibility. And also, how to understand is uh, probability. So, as I explained, it is just the long run relative frequency that the, the outcome is in this set. Right, which is defined as the probability of the set. And also, uh, 
we said probability must be between 0 and 1. Why is so? Because it has a long-run relative frequency. Relative frequency must be a number between 0 and 1, right? So the probability is just a limit. As a result, the limit must also be between 0 and 1. So probability is 0. What does it mean? So you can also think of a relative frequency. So relative frequency is 0 means that you perform this random experiment many, many times. But so you haven't seen an outcome in the, in the set you are interested in, right? So in this case, so you perform a lot of times, but you didn't see the outcome in the set of the interest. So if you perform this a lot of times, many, many times, it means that it will never happen, right? Because this, so probability zero means that it is impossible that the outcome is in the set. And on the contrary, probability one, probability one means that you perform the experiment many, many times. And each time, you see the outcome is in this set, which means that this set must happen. The outcome must be in the set. The set is big enough, right? So probability one means that the outcome must be in this set. And also, you can, you can think, so the closer the probability is to one, means that it's very, very likely that the outcome is in the set you are interested in. If the probability is closer to zero, means that it's unlikely to be in the set you're interested in, right? So it's uh, pretty uh, intuitive. So now I think uh, uh, I just uh, introduced the uh, intuitive explanation of probability. So now let's, uh, so let me, let me introduce some, some more rigorous stuff. So first, when we talk about probability, uh, the very first notion is called sample space. What is sample space? Sample space is just the set of all possible outcomes of a random experiment. So by a convention, we usually use this a lowercase uh, omega for an outcome, the arbitrary outcome. And the sample space uh, is usually denoted by a capital omega, so the, the space omega. So maybe uh, let me give you some very simple example. So if we flip a coin, we know that so it has only two outcomes, has or tails, right? In this way, because uh, sample space is defined to be the set of all possible outcomes, so then the sample space is just uh, just like this. So H for has, T for tails, right? Two outcomes. And if we flip a die, so we know that so the, the die has six uh, facets, right? So the outcome could be one up to six. So that's the sample space. And uh, it's possible that we, we flip this coin not just once, but this time we flip it twice, two times, right? Two times, then the outcome could be like this. The first flip is has, the second flip is has, so HH, where the first one is tails, second one is has, TH, and so on, right? So in this way, we may have four different outcomes if we flip it twice. So then another another notion is called event. So recall that we just said we define probability over set of outcomes, right? The set of outcomes is called an event. In probability theory, when we talk about event, so it means that so a set of outcomes. So in other words, it's just a subset of sample space. So we only define probability for events. 
we no longer define probability for all commas, right? But again, as I said, it is possible that an event has a single all comma. So in this way, so we can define probability for a set of a single single all comma, right? So here's an example. So we flip off the point one, uh, once. We know that the sample space is a heads or tails, right? Then if we define an event A to be the set containing only tails, then this A is an event, right? We can define the probability of A, which is just the probability of tails, which is one half, right? Then uh, sometimes it's more convenient for us to, to give a, to specify an event by a description rather than listing all outcomes. So, for example, if we consider, consider so this example, we flip the die. We know that the sample space is one up to six, right? So we consider the event A, which is called the outcome is odd, right? The outcome is odd means the outcome should be an odd number. So one up to six, so there are three odd numbers. One, three, five. So according to this description, then this event should have three all comes. One, three, five. So this is a, another way to specify a event, right? So this is an event. And also, maybe we can consider uh, flipping a coin twice. We know that the symbol space is like this. So if we define an event, which is called the first flip is has. The first flip is has, means the second flip could be has, could be tails. It does not matter, right? So then within this symbol space, there are two all comps satisfying so this condition, so which could be HH or HT. So by this descriptive uh, definition of this event, it has two outcomes, right? So it's uh, this event. So here, there's another term called occurrence. So we know that event is just a, a set of outcomes. Right? You perform this random experiment, then you check the all call. If this all call happens to be in the event you're interested in, then we say that this event occurs. So this occurrence. The event A is said to occur if the all call of the random experiment is in A. A occur. So for example, if you flip a die, so then either the, the outcomes of 1, 3, or 5, then we can say that this A occurs. This event, the outcome is odd, occurs. Right? So that's standard terminology. So then, uh, <coughs> because uh, events are sets, then let's have a very brief review of basic set operations, right? So, so this uh, this is the the regular, uh, the very common, the so-called Venn diagram. So in a Venn diagram, so we usually use a, a big rectangle to represent the, the sample space, the set of all possible outcomes, right? And then uh, we may have uh, two events, A and B, just two sets, right? So this shaded area here, this shaded area is just a, the common area of both A and B. So the element in this shaded area is in both A and B. So it's an intersection, intersection of A and B. And uh, the elements 
either in A or D. So, so this set is a, this shaded area is the union of A and B, right? And uh, this is a compl uh, complement. So this rectangle is sample space. This shaded area is in the sample space, but not in A, right? So it's a A complement. So, and uh, we may consider a special case. This is A, this is B, but they don't have uh, common elements. So in this case, so if the intersection of A and B is empty set, in this case, A and B are set to be disjoint or mutually ex ex exclusive. So the intersection of them is uh, empty. So this is a, a case. So, that's, so then this is a, some uh, standard uh, set of operations. And I'll give you some a very simple example. Say if we flip a die, the outcome is like this. Uh, if event A is 1, 3, 5, then B is 3 and 6. Then A union B would be the set of outcomes either in A or B, right? Either in A or B, it should be. 1, 3, 5, 6. A intersect B will be the set of all comes both in A and B. They're common elements, right? The common one is just uh, 3. So this set is just uh, the set containing 3. And what is a B complement? So it should be in the sample space, but not in B. It should be 1, 2, 4, 5, right? And this is a, a pretty standard. And uh, uh, there's certain rules of uh, set operations. I think that it's also a uh, very standard. So they have uh, uh, commutative laws, uh, associative laws, distributive laws, right? So I think you need to be clear of that because this is very basic. I, I won't spend time on this. And uh, if you wish to... Uh, see the proof of this. So the most convenient way is to use a line diagram. Just uh, draw some pictures like this. Right? If you check the textbook, there's certain uh, illustration for these laws. So I just uh, leave it to you because it's basic. And also, uh, there's uh, De Morgan's laws. So this De Morgan's laws it's also important. Uh, it says something like this. So, for example, if we consider n events, we call them A1 up to AN, right? Then uh, there are two De Morgan's laws. The first law is like this. So, we just uh, make the union of these n events together and then take the complement, which is on the left-hand side. So there's a complement of the union. So it's equal to the intersection of their respective complements, so which is the first De Morgan's law. The second De, De Morgan's law says something like this. On the left-hand side, we first to take the in intersection of those uh, and events, and then take the complement. So this guy is equal to the union of their respective complements. So this is the second. This is the second De Morgan's laws. Uh, De Morgan's laws actually it's, uh, it's very easy to memorize that. So how to how to memorize that? You just uh, keep in mind on the right hand side, it's either complement of the union or the complement of the intersection, right? You do union or intersection first, then take the complement. On the right-hand side, on the right-hand side, you just uh, threw, threw out the parentheses. But in order to make them equal, you need to change the union into intersection or the intersection into union. 
it just changed the, you know, the direction of the cup. It just uh, put it upside down, right? So that's the that's the way to to memorize the Morgan's law. Because uh, the Morgan's law is also uh, a standard stuff. Just uh, leave it to you uh, to read the, the proof in the in the textbook. So that's this, this is something about basic set operations. Again, because uh, probability is defined over events, so events are just sets of all comps. So then you need to know such basic set operations. If you cannot memorize everything, so you need to go back to check the textbook to make sure so you know this stuff. Okay, so now we are ready to to introduce the the rigorous definition of probability. So what is a probability? Actually, we don't just introduce a probability. We need to introduce uh, all the materials to, to all the materials we need to define a probability. So then, so such a such a thing is called probability space. When we call when we talk about probability, so in your mind, you need to first uh, first understand that. So there should be an underlying probability space. So what is a probability space? Probability space actually is a triple or something something consisting of three parts. The first part is a sample space, right? As I said, when we talk about probability, so you need to understand that there's a there should be some random experiment. What is a random experiment? Random experiment is a is an experiment whose outcomes cannot cannot be known in advance, right? So then, the random experiment there should be outcomes. Then, in your mind, you, you, should, you first you, you need to know that there is a set of all possible outcomes. All outcomes are organized there, and it is called sample space. That's the very first thing we need to define probability. The second thing is is this X. It's called a collection of events. So why we need to introduce this thing? Because uh, as I explained, we only define probability over events, over sets of outcomes, right? So then we need to we need stuff over which we can define probability. So we just uh, organize the such things together. So each thing is just an event. We organize all the events together, and this uh, F is just a collection of events. We need to have sample space, and use this sample space to create a lot of events. Collect all the events together, and then we define probability over such events, right? And then, Let's talk about probability. What is a probability? Probability is just a rule to assign numbers to events. Right? So, what is a probability? Previously, we interpreted probability as long run relative frequencies. Right? So then, of course, for it to be a long run relative frequency, we cannot assign an arbitrary number to be a probability of an event, right? And uh, for it to be a relative frequency, a long run relative frequency, it must satisfy certain rules, right? So then, there could be a lot of rules, but there's only three basic rules. As long as, so this rule, this P, satisfies the following three rules, it can be called a probability. So let's check, so these three rules. 
the first rule is the probability of the sample space is equal to 1. How do I understand this? So I think it's a pretty straightforward. As I explained, what is probability? It can be understood as a law of relative frequency, right? If it is a law of relative frequency, then you just uh, perform run experiment many, many times. And what is sample space? Sample space is of all possible outcomes. So you do the random experiment many, many times. So each time you see an outcome. This outcome must be in the sample space because uh, sample space has all, right? Then you do that many, many times. But each time the relative fre frequency must be equal to 1. You take the limit and also equal to 1, right? So the probability of sample space is equal to 1. Essentially, it just uh, tells the fact that the sample space has everything. And I need to make sure that this probability is a law of relative frequency. Okay? That's the intuitive idea. It's very simple. And the second requirement is that for an arbitrary event A, the probability of A must be bigger or equal to zero. What does it mean? So it's also very easy to understand. What is the probability? Lower well, relative frequency, right? So relative frequency must be a number between zero and one. You take a limit, of course, it cannot be a series of numbers which is all above zero. The limit cannot be below zero, right? So it just says something like this. For well, the third condition, the third condition is a. Uh, it could be a bit confusing for someone. So. It says something like this. So we have a bunch of uh, pairwise disjoint events. So we call them A1, A2, A3, and so on. So we have uh, infinitely many events. So A1, A2, and so on. They're pairwise disjoint. So what does it mean? Pairwise disjoint means uh, if we pick any two of them, a1, A2, A3, and so on. We'll pick any two of them. It should be disjoint. Disjoint means they have no common elements, right? So the intersection of them must be zero. Pairwise disjoint, we we'll pick any two of them, no common elements, right? The third requirement is something like this. The probability of the union of these guys should be equal to the sum of their respective probabilities. So this one could be a bit confusing. What does it mean, right? So maybe to help you to understand this, maybe uh, let me let me explain this uh, by uh, a simple example. So uh, this is my her written notes. So let's uh, consider an example like this. So suppose we flip a die. So we know that flip a die, the sample space will be like this. So one after six, right? And then let's consider two events, A1 and A2. A1 is the event that has two outcomes, one and two. And A2 is the event that has only one outcome, which is three, right? 
So you see that A1 and A2 are disjoint. So, in other words, the, the intersection of them is empty. Then, suppose that we flip a die n times. And this n is a large number, many, many times, right? And uh, among, the, among the n flips, A1 occurs n one time. And A2 occurs in two times. So what does it mean? Occurrence means uh, the outcome is in A1. The outcome is in A2, right? The outcome is in A1 means the outcome is either 1 or 2. The outcome is in e A2 means the outcome is 3, right? So then, let's think of the relative frequency of uh, A1 union A2. A1 union A2, so we flip the, the die n times, right? Among them, so A1 occurs n one times and A2 occur n two times. So here, because uh, A1 and A2 are disjoint, which means that if A1 occurs, a2 cannot occur. If A2 occurs, A1 cannot occur, right? So, if either of them occurs, so the number of times should be just equal to N1 plus N2. So, A1 union A2, which means that, so the outcome is either 1, 2, or 3, right? So the outcome is either 1 or 2 for n1 times. The outcome is 3 for n2 times. So the relative frequency for 1, 2, or 3 should be n1 plus n2 times over n times, right? So why can we do this uh, very simple addition? Because uh, a1 and a2 are disjoint. If they have common elements, common outcomes, then we can we cannot simply do this, right? So because of this, this relative frequency is just n1 plus n2 over n. And this n1 plus n2 over n, of course, is equal to n1 over n plus n2 over n. Then you may ask me the question, why bother to do this, right? Because uh, you can see that this n1 over n is the relative frequency of A1. This n2 over n is the relative frequency of A, of A2, right? So through this very simple example, you can see that as long as A1 and A2 are disjoint, then the relative frequency of their union should be equal to the relative frequency of a1 plus that of A2, right? So this is very, very easy to understand. Then what is probability? Probability is the long run relative frequency, right? When n goes to infinity, larger and larger, then those relative frequencies should converge to numbers, which are probabilities, right? And because of this, so, relative frequency of A1 union A2 should converge to probability of their union. And uh, so relative frequency of A1 and that of A2 will converge to the probability of A1 plus probability of A2, right? So you see that in this very simple example, you see that we should have uh, some property like this because uh, probability should be understood as one of relative frequencies, then, so if we have two events, A1 and A2, that are disjoint, then the probability of their union should be equal to the sum of their respective probabilities, right? So this is the, so this is the uh, an explanation. So here, so 
So let's, uh, let's, let's come back to this, to the third condition. The third condition actually says something less so much of this, but the idea would be the same, but now we consider infinitely many pairwise destroying events. So because those guys are disjoint, then similar to what we just discussed, the probability of the union of them should be equal to the, the sum of their respective probabilities. Why we must have this? Because uh, probability should be understood as a normal relative frequency, right? As long as the relative frequencies, as long as so those guys are pairwise disjoint, we should have this. So that's the idea. Then, as long as, so this P, so such a rule for assigned numbers to events can satisfy these three conditions, then it can be called a probability. It can be interpreted as a law of relative frequencies. Right? So this is the definition of uh, probability space. So, uh, questions? So, if uh, you do have any questions, you can you can you can you can pop up through the chat box anytime or ask me here immediately. So, if you don't have questions, I think we can have a break ten minutes. Okay, uh, let's move on. So uh, we just described the, the, the definition of probability space, right? Uh, again, probability space has three parts, a simple space, so the collection of events and uh, a rule. The rule is called a probability, right? And then, <coughs> then maybe uh, I, I will just give you a set comment because uh, some of you may, may, may be a bit confused why we bother to to introduce this uh, F, which is a collection of events, right? Because uh, if uh, if uh, probability can be defined for any set of outcomes, then why bother to collect them together? By default, it's there, right? So we define so this uh, F as a collection of events because uh, actually, in certain cases, uh, if the sample space is, uh, is too big. So what does, what does it mean it's too big? Too big means uh, if the sample space, say, is uh, infinite, it could be fine. If it's countably many, it could be fine. But if it's uh, uncountably many, sometimes, then if uh, events is defined to be an arbitrary set of all comes, then we may not be able to find out uh, a useful rule that satisfies these three conditions. So that's why sometimes if this sample space is too big, then we need to make extra conditions about this uh, collection of events. So that's why we need to introduce uh, so, so this uh, notation F. But this is just a set comment. It, it is not important in this course, but in case that some, some of you may feel confused, I think that's the that's the reason, because uh, so by introducing this F, actually we need to implicitly make some constriction of uh, eligible sets of outcomes. In certain cases, not an arbitrary set of outcomes could be an event, which means that we may not find a a useful way to assign probabilities on that. But this is a, a very technical, a very technical issue, which is not important for our course. But in this course, I think uh, uh, you can safely believe uh, this F just uh, any set, a collection of any set of uh, uh, outcomes is okay. So for example, if we think of uh, uh, a rolling die, 
the sample. So which means that the sample space is one up to six. We have six outcomes. Then what will be this F, this collection of events? It is just a, just a, a collection of all subset of uh, sample space. So for example, we know that M to set is a subset of any set, right? So it must be a subset of the sample space. So this empty set must be in this uh, uh, collection. And also, we organize all sets of uh, one outcome, so which is one, two, three, up to six, right? And also, uh, we can pick up uh, sets of uh, two outcomes, one, two, one, three, two, three, and so on, right? And uh, until the entire sample space. So this F actually is uh, all subsets of the sample space. So this is the collection. So this is the, uh, <coughs> this is the definition of the probability space. So this probability space, uh, so from the definition of probability space, actually we can derive certain properties of uh, probability. So for example, we can show that the probability of uh, empty set must be equal to zero. So how do we understand this? So this one actually is a very intuitive. Empty set, we know that it's just set that has nothing, right? So what is a probability? Probability is just a long run relative frequency. You perform a running experiment each time you see an outcome, right? Is this all coming in the empty set? Definitely no, because the empty set has nothing. Because the empty set has nothing, and whatever outcome you have, so on empty set will not occur, right? You perform the random experiment many, many times, then what is the number of times empty set will occur? Always zero, right? Relative frequency, always zero. You take the limit, the limit must also be zero. So that's uh, why this set, so this property must be there. But of course, this is just an argument. Argument, it is not a proof, right? So then let's see how to, how to prove this. So the proof is, uh, is just like this. So before I show you the proof, I would, I would let you know that uh, in the exam, I won't ask you to prove things. So just, uh, I just give you a description of a question to ask you to derive a number, a probability, or whatever. So I won't ask you to prove things. But I think that, uh, so to let you know some basic proofs, it would be helpful for you to understand so our certain conceptions. So that's why I also need you to, to check this proof. But as I said, proofs are not required in the exam. So in your homework, so you will, you will, you will, not, you will not be asked to, to prove things either. So, so let's see how to prove this, this thing. So we wish to show that the probability of uh, empty set must be equal to zero, right? Then, to prove things, then, so first we need to check what we have. What will be our materials for the proof, right? So far, the only thing we have is the definition of probability space, right? That's the only rigorous thing we have. So we must prove this thing from the definition of uh, probability space. Then let's recall what is the definition of probability space? So it says that for, for this P to be a probability, it must satisfy three conditions, right? The first condition is that probability of the sample space is equal to one. The second condition is that the probability of any event must be bigger or equal to zero. The third one is that if you have uh, a series of uh, infinitely many events that are 
pairwise disjoint, then the probability of the union is equal to the sum of their respective probabilities, right? Then we must derive, so this result, out of these three conditions. So let's see how to do that. So here, so first let's check the, the third condition. So this is a, for an arbitrary bunch of events that are pairwise disjoint, right? Then maybe we can take a special case. Maybe we'll let this A1 to be omega, to be the simple space. Why bother to do this? Because we know that the probability of the sample space is equal to 1. So we wish to use something we know to derive something we don't know yet, right? So, so here, so the sample space seems to be a nice guy because we know the probability of that, right? So let A1 to be the sample space. Then we can let all other guys to be the empty space. Right? So, so the empty space is, uh, is a target we wish to study. So we just let all other guys to be empty. So then, so let's check. Let's check them. So we hope they are pairwise disjoint. Because uh, if so, we can use the third condition. So let's check whether it's pairwise disjoint. Of course, it should be because uh, there's only one set which is not empty. If you just pick any two of them, then at least one of them must be empty. Empty set intersect another set, it must be empty, right? So you see that if we pick them in this way, then they're pairwise disjoint. If they're pairwise disjoint, we can use the third condition, so which is, uh, which is great. So, because they're pairwise disjoint, then let's consider, let's consider this. On the left-hand side, what is the, what is the union of them? The union of them, you see, must be the sample space, right? Because sample space is everything. You, you make a union of whatever can be bigger than that. And A1 is the sample space, so the union of them is just a sample space. And then, uh, then, so because uh, the union of them is just the simple space, then the probability of the union is equal to the sum of the respective probabilities, right? So the sum of their respective probabilities. The first one is probability of A1 plus the summation of uh, probability of A2, A3, and so on, right? We just uh, pick A1 out of the summation because uh, A1 is not empty. All other guys are empty. A1 is the, is the sample space. So it's here. So this guy is A1. And for A2, A3, all other guys are empty. So this is the, so this is, uh, so this thing, right? So we see that on the life hand side, because the union of all such AIs are the sample space. So on the left hand side, it is equal to 1, right? On the right hand side, what do we have? We know that the probability of A1 is the probability of the sample space, which is 1, right? And plus the summation of uh, probability of uh, a lot of empty sets, right? Left hand side is equal to one. Right hand side is equal, is equal to one plus something, right? So which means that this something must be equal to zero. So zero. And now we can use the second property, right? The probability of any event must be bigger or equal to zero. So then, the probability of a lot of uh, same thing is equal to zero, which means that each of them must be equal to zero, because each one must be bigger or equal to zero, right? So in this way, you can, sh you can see that the probability of any set must be equal to zero. So 
that's the proof. Here, I think it's a, the proof is, is simple, very simple, but I think it's, a, it's very nice because uh, you see that even if for this very simple, very intuitive result, we have used all three conditions of uh, probability space, right? So I think it's uh, very nice. So uh, this is the proof, how to prove this uh, probability of empty set is zero. And uh, actually, it's uh, uh, the proof is already in the in the in my, uh, in my on my slide. But actually, I uh, may not have as many details as I show you uh, in my notes. But I think it does not matter as long but as long as you can memorize this result. I think it's fine. So this is the the first result. Another result, another property of probability is like this. So suppose that this time we have n pairwise disjoint events. We call them A1 up to AM. So then the probability of uh, uh, their union is equal to the sum of their respective uh, probabilities. So what is this? So here, if you check this, if you compare this with the third condition, you see that the only difference is that in the third condition, we require, so we require that we have uh, uh, infinitely many pairwise destroying events. But in this proposition, uh, we have finitely many pairwise destroying events, right? So, so in this sense, actually, this is a weaker result than the, the third condition. So because it's, it is weaker, actually, it is, uh, it is very easy to prove this. So how to show this? Actually, because we wish to, because this one seems very similar to the third condition. So, of course, uh, in our minds, we wish to use the third condition. How to use that? So we have, if we have only finite many events, of course, we can add more empty sets to make it infinitely many, right? So the idea is pretty straightforward. So we just uh, define a sub n plus 1, a sub n plus 2, and so on. We just uh, add infinitely many empty sets to make all of them pairwise disjoint, right? Because A1 up to AN already pairwise disjoint. Then if we add many empty sets, they're also pairwise disjoint. It does not matter, right? Because uh, empty sets has nothing. Then, in this way, Let's consider what is the right, uh, left hand side. Left hand side is the probability of the union of n events. But because uh, we add uh, a lot of empty events, uh, empty sets, so, so this union actually is just equal to the union of all of them. We add empty sets, we add nothing, right? And because, uh, so these events, infinitely many events are, are pairwise disjoint. So, which allows us to use the third condition. So then, the probability of the union is equal to the sum of their respective probabilities. We have this, right? So if we have this, this summation is uh, i from 1 to infinity. Now we can consider i from 1 to n, the first n events, and the rest of them. For the rest of them, we know that i from n plus 1 up to infinity, all of them, ai, all such ai's are just an empty set, right? So just to prove that the probability of an empty set is equal to zero. So, so which means that we just add a lot of zeros. It does not matter. That zero is zero, right? So then, so 
So this summation is simply equal to zero, so now we have this one. So if we check the left hand side is the probability of the union of those uh, new guys, and the right hand side is the summation of the probability of those new guys. So we have this result, we just prove that. So you see that to prove this, actually we use the third condition together with uh, the previous result that we just proved. The probability of empty set is zero, right? I think it's, uh, this is also very uh, straightforward. So another property is that the probability of uh, the complement of the event should be equal to one minus the probability of this uh, event. How do I understand this? Actually, this is also very straight, straightforward. So maybe let's first think of what, what is this uh, probability of A means. So we know that it can be interpreted as the long run uh, relative frequency of uh, the occurrence of A. So long run relative frequency of A. So you perform a random experiment. So the outcome is either in A or not in A each time, right? If it is in A, then if it's not in A, it must be in A complement, right? So in other words, each time, either A occurs or A complement occurs, no matter how many times you perform this random experiment. Again, each time, either A occurs or A complement occurs. Because of this property, then if you think of the relative frequency, then you see after each time, the relative frequency of A plus the relative frequency of A complement must be equal to 1. Because each time, either A occurs or A complement occurs, right? So the number of times add together must be equal to 1. So the relative frequency of A plus the relative frequency of A complement must be equal to 1. Then we take the limit, the probability of A plus the probability of A complement must also be equal to 1. So that's why this claim must be correct, right? So then, but of course this is not a proof, this is just argument. What is the proof? The proof it's also very simple. So here, so let's think of the, the union of A and A complement. So what is the definition of uh, A complement? The definition of K, uh, A complement is the set of all comps that is in the sample space but not in A, right? Because of this uh, definition, so you can definitely see that a union A complement should be equal to the entire sample space, right? And also, because uh, so no element can be both in A and in complement. So, so these two guys must be destroyed. And because of this, so you see, A and A complement are just the two destroying events. So, we can use this result, right? The probability of their union must be equal to the sum of their respective probabilities. The union of them is a sample space, so the probability of the union is equal to 1. And this 1 is equal to the sum of their respective probabilities. So probability of A plus probability of A complement is equal to 1, so the probability of A complement must be equal to 1 minus probability of A, right? So that's it. So this is uh, also very, very simple. Uh, <coughs> so a very straightforward uh, result of this thing is that the probability of any event must be less than or equal to 1. So intuitively, it is very easy to understand because uh, 
So probability of A is just a long relative frequency of A, right? Relative frequency must be something between 0 and 1. If you take a limit, it cannot be bigger than 1. No way, right? So, but how to prove that? So this is just a very straightforward consequence of the previous result. So previous result says that the probability of A complement is equal to 1 minus probability of A. So the probability of A is equal to 1 minus so that of the complement, right? Because the probability of complement must be bigger or equal to 0, so as a result, probability of A cannot be bigger than 1, right? So this is a also very simple. And uh, another result is that if A and B, if A is a subset of B, then the probability of A must be less than or equal to the probability of B. So let's see how to prove this. So this thing actually is also uh, very straightforward. So it's, a, it's easy to understand that from a, a line diagram. So here, uh, so this uh, rectangle is the entire sample space, right? Suppose that is a, a bigger circle is, is a event B and the little one is A, right? Why we draw that like this? Because A is a subset of B. So then let's think of this uh, uh, green part. So actually this green part, you see, this green part is, is within B but not in A, right? So what is that? Because it's in B but not in A, so it must be the union of B and A complement. If it's not in A, it must be in A complement, right? So it's A complement union B. So we can see that because the A is a subset of B. So this A plus this green part, so we will have a B, the entire B. So A union, so this green part is B. And because uh, this green part is part of A complement, which means that, so it must be destroyed with A. So a and the screen part should be destroyed. So in this way, you can see by drawing this picture like this, we just divide this B into two parts. The first part is A. The other part is A complement union B, so which is a destroyed part of A. So because uh, so A and the screen part are destroyed, so, so actually the probability of B is equal to probability of A plus the probability of this green part, right? And this green part, because it's a probability, definitely it should be bigger or equal to zero. So as a result, the probability of B must be bigger or equal to probability of A. So it's, a, it's just like this, a pretty straightforward. So uh, another another uh, property is like this. So for a general case, uh, if we consider two events A and B, so then the probability of a union B is equal to probability of A plus probability of B minus the probability of their intersection. So how to prove this? Maybe uh, I think I don't bother to prove this because I just uh, give you a picture. And as long as uh, you can understand this line diagram very well, then I think it's, uh, it's very easy for you to understand this. So here we have A, we have B. We have two events. We wish to know the probability of them. So we can think that's uh, just the area of, of this shaded, shaded, shaded region, right? You wish to know the area of this shaded region. Actually, it's uh, just... Uh, this shaded region is just so this part, so which is A, right? Plus, so this part, 
what is this part? So this part is B, remove the intersection. So why bother to do this? Because uh, this part and this shaded part, they're, they're disjoint, right? Because if they're disjoint, then the probability of their union is equal to the sum of their respective probabilities, right? So then, what is the, the area of this guy? It's just a probability of A, right? What is uh, this guy? It's a probability of B minus the common part, so minus the probability of A intersect B. So that's, a, that's the second term and the third term, right? So from this, you can clearly see that it's, uh, that's the way to find out the probability of A union B. I think uh, that's it. Um, so let's uh, think of uh, a simple example. So suppose we flip a die. Of course, the sample space has six outcomes. And we consider three, uh, three events. A is uh, the outcome is odd. B is three and six. C is the outcome is even. So then if this die is a fair die. Fair die means that the chance that you see each outcome will be the same, right? The, 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 the probability you see one, two, three, all, one over six. So we lose the uh, probability of A, so because uh, A has three outcomes, right? So then it should be three over six. What is the probability of B? So 2 over 6, right? What is the probability of B complement? B has two outcomes. B complement should have uh, four outcomes, right? So 4 over 6. What is the probability of A union B? B union B, 1, 3, 5, 6, 4 outcomes. So 4 over 6. What is the probability of A union B, uh, A intersect B? So the common element or common outcome of these two sets, just three, right? So one over six. So what is the A union C? A union C will be the sample space R6. So it's one. And the A intersect C. So no common elements. These two sets are disjoint. So it's uh, zero, right? It's a... Uh, it's just a baby example. Okay, so that I think that's a that's the basic the, the very basic conception of uh, uh, probabilities. So before I move on, uh, do you have any questions? So. If you have no questions, maybe uh, let's uh, think of an uh, example like this. So, suppose you would like to flip a die, right? So, yeah, you gamble, you flip a die. So, this die is a fair die. Again, fair die means the chance that you see each outcome would be 1 over 6. So, suppose the, the rule is like this. If the outcome is either... One or three, you win two dollars. Otherwise, you lose one dollar, right? So, of course, as a gambler, you're interested in the event that you win. You win means the outcome is either one or three, right? So, the event A is defined as the event that has one and three. So because this die is a fair die, so the probability that you win will be two over six, which is one third. So it's uh, pretty simple, right? So then, suppose that the die has tossed out. So, but it has been flipped. But before you can see the outcome, 
So he was collared by somebody. And uh, so that guy can see the alcohol, but you cannot. So before you can see the alcohol, so that guy told you that the alcohol is on. So suppose that that guy would not tell you a lie, just to tell you the truth. So you are told the all comes out. So in this case, the question is, is the probability that you have one is still one third? So this is the example. So let's think of this uh, question. So this one, actually this question is, uh, is very easy. So again, if the outcome is one or three, you will win. But before you see the outcome, so the random experiment has been conducted. It's done. It's done, but you haven't known the outcome. At least you know something. You don't know the outcome, but you know some information. You have some yeah. information because uh, so this guy told you that the all uh, the the outcome is off, right? So essentially, so the question is like this: with this extra piece of information, so is the probability that you won still the same, right? Of course, this is, as I said, this is a very simple example. Because uh, you know that the odd, the outcome is odd, which means that the outcome is either one, three, or five, right? Originally, so before you perform this random experiment, your sample space has six outcomes, right? One out of six. But based on the information you have, you don't have to consider outcome two, four, and six, right? So with this extra piece of information, indeed, the sample space has shrinked. So originally, you have six outcomes. But after you know this extra piece of information, your effective sample space it's just the one, three, and five, right? In this case, actually, you can easily understand that the probability will also change. Originally, it's two out of six outcomes. That's the chance you win. But now, it's two out of three outcomes, right? So in this case, you can see that the probability that you have one should be two thirds instead of one third, right? So this is a very simple example, but uh, this example, I think, through this example, I would like you to to think about a question like this. So the probability actually. It can be changed after you know some extra information, right? So let's think of a more general case. So suppose that there are two events. We call them A and B. So you're interested in the probability that A occurs. So just like, uh, like this. You're interested in the probability that the outcome is either one or three, right? Which is A. Then the experiment is performed. And uh, before you can see the outcome, you only know that B occurs before you can see the outcome, right? So with this actual information, so generally speaking, the probability that A occurs will change. Why it will change? Just like what I said just now. So before the experiment is performed, actually your outcome could be 
anything within the sample space. Anything within this big rectangle, right? But just before, we are told that B occurs. B occurs means that the all com all side B can be excluded, right? Essentially, the sample space has shrinked from the big omega into B, right? Because of this, if you're still interested in the probability of A, actually, the chance that the outcome is in A should be here. If it is in A, it must be in the intersection of uh, A and B, right? Because you know B occurs. You know B occurs if A also occurs, then the outcome must be in the intersection of A and B. So in, in this case, generally speaking, the probability will change. And such a probability is called conditional probability. Conditional condition means that you know B occurs. B is the condition. B is an extra piece of information. You know extra piece of information you, in fact, if sample space will change, the probability will also change, right? So, through this, actually, we can define a very, very important notion called conditional probability. So, which is defined like this. So, we have two events, A and B. And suppose that the probability of B is bigger than zero. Then the conditional probability of A given B so is defined like this. So first, it's written in this way, probability of A given B. So what is the meaning of that? The meaning of that is that before you know the outcome, you know that B occurs. If at this time you're still interested in the probability of A, then the probability of A should change from an unconditional probability into a conditional probability, right? Because you already know this extra piece of information. So this is the notation of this conditional probability. Then let's think of how to, how to calculate such a probability. So we can think that, so probability could be think of as the fraction of areas of area over the entire sample space. Right. Originally, it is uh, the fraction of the circle A, right? But after you know that B occurs, as I said, the effective sample space has shrinked. Now, the sample space for you is no longer a capital B. It's just B, right? If A occurs, so A is just this intersection. The outcome is just in this intersection. Accordingly, the probability of A given B should be, so the fraction of this intersection over the area of B, right? So what is conditional probability? Conditional probability is just based on this idea. It is defined as the probability of intersection of A and B divided by the probability of B. So this thing is called conditional probability, right? So then, in the previous example, so you're interested in the event A, so which is an event consisting of one and three, right? And you are told, before you know the outcome, you are told that the outcome is on. So which means that you know the outcome is a one, four, and five, right? Then based on this definition of conditional uh, probability, then, so this conditional probability is just the probability of intersection divided by the probability of condition. So A intersect B is just one three, right? And probability of B, so it has three outcomes. So you see that based on this uh, definition of conditional probability, in the numerator is 2 over 6, in the denominator is 3 over 6. So this uh, offer, you know the outcome is odd, then the probability that you have 1 
should be 2 over 4, right? Just, uh, just the same as we discussed it, uh, just now. So this is the uh, conditional probability, the definition of the conditional probability. So think of that's a, a conditional probability of, uh, will be the, the main topic uh, of the next lecture. We will, I think we will discuss next week.